Hello everyone, my name is Michael Trong and I'm the executive director of the Chinese American Museum here in Los Angeles. On behalf of the entire board and staff, I warmly welcome the panelists and all attendees to the discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to read a statement which acknowledges the original stewards of the land our museum resides on. The Chinese American Museum acknowledges that this virtual event is taking place across the continental continent of North America, also known as Turtle Island, original and unseceded territory of hundreds of sovereign indigenous people and nations. We acknowledge and honor the original caretakers of the various places our speakers are joining us from. Today, I am joining you from downtown Los Angeles in the facilities of the Chinese American Museum, physically located on the historic village site of Yangna in the Tovanga unceded traditional territories of the Gabalino, Shoshone, Quiche, and Tongva indigenous people of these lands. To this day, there are at least seven tribes of, of Gabalino people who maintain an ongoing presence, power, and relations amongst their people, their natural relations, and the land they belong to. I invite you to remember the indigenous people who affirm the sovereignty and ongoing relations with the land you currently occupy and ask yourself, how do you, your people, or your organizations honor these relatives? Thank you for serving this land acknowledgement with me. Before we begin the program, here are some things that we need to know. The program is being recorded and may be made public to for you in the future. Please keep your microphone and video off during the duration of the program. At the end of the program, we'll take a group photo. At this point, a CAN staff member will provide instructions on how to turn on your video for those who wish to participate. For the best experience, we ask all participants to watch us in speaker view. The chat box is currently unavailable. However, if you do need assistance, you may still send a private chat to the host Chinese American Museum. We are pleased to be hosting a series of commemorative events this entire week. Tonight is day six of our eight days of programming. While the museum has been working to prepare for our many events, the city of Los Angeles has been concurrently leading its own efforts to creating a memorial for the lost lives of, in the Chinese massacre of 1871. CAM has worked closely with the Memorial Steering Committee and we are honored to deepen our relationship with the city of Los Angeles and the members of the committee. Now, I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, Christopher Hawthorne, who will provide more details about the city's efforts. Christopher is the Chief Designer Officer for the city of Los Angeles, a position appointed by Mayor Garcetti. In this role, he developed new initiatives and provide design oversights related to architecture, urban design, planning, and public art across the city. Prior to joining City Hall, he was an architecture critic for the Los Angeles Times from 2004 to 2018. Christopher is also a professor of practice with an appointment in the Department of English at the Dorn, a USC Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. A frequent collaborator, with KCET TV, a PBS affiliate in Los Angeles, he wrote and directed the hour long documentary, That Far Corner, Frank Lord's Wright in Los Angeles, which he received an LA Area Emmy Award in 2019. Christopher grew up in Berkeley, California, and holds a bachelor's degree with honors from Yale, where he studied political science and architectural history. Christopher, thank you so much for being here tonight. I look forward to hearing from, uh, about the work that all of you have been doing. I pass the program now on to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael. And let me express my thanks uh, and appreciation to everyone at CAM for the remarkable six days now of programming out of eight, as Michael mentioned, uh, marking the 150th anniversary of the 1871 Chinese massacre. It's just a remarkable uh, amount of, of work in service of deepening our understanding of this event, which um, so many Angelinos have been unaware of. And, and, that, and that's really the basis from which we begin. It's really telling this story to Angelinos so we can begin to think about how to grapple with it and not least how to produce a memorial. So really honored to be here and honored to have a chance to talk about the connections between the Mayor's Office Civic Memory uh, Working Group uh, which began in 2019 and this steering committee that Michael mentioned that has been developing the basic framework for a memorial to the victims of the 1871 massacre. And we'll be talking about both of those initiatives this evening. And to do that, we have a remarkable panel, uh, city colleagues 
friends who have been uh, working with us on this steering committee and helping us frame these questions about how best to mark um, this one of the darkest days, not just in Los Angeles history, but in American history, truly, um, when nearly 10% of the Chinese population of Los Angeles was killed in a single, in a single afternoon uh, and evening. So to help us talk about all of these subjects, we're really pleased to be joined by Jessica Coloza, Annie Chu, and Michael Wu, and I'll introduce each of them in turn. Jessica Coloza is a commissioner on the Board of Public Works, the governing body of nearly 6,000 employees responsible for delivering critical services and infrastructure projects for the city's 4 million residents. She was appointed by Mayor Garcetti in 2019, and she is the first Filipina to serve on the board. Jessica, welcome, and thanks so much for being here. And I want to give a special thanks to Jessica because she is in the midst of coordinating the closure of the 101 freeway um, to make way for more construction progress on the 6th Street Viaduct, which is a project that she and the board have been uh, providing tremendous leadership on. So I know it's a busy week in all kinds of ways for you, Jessica, so we really appreciate you being here and landing your insight. Thank you. Also with us, Annie Chu, an architect, interior designer, exhibition designer, and a founding principal of the award-winning firm Chu Gooding, a firm that I think many of us are familiar with, working extensively with, extensively with world-renowned museums, cultural facilities, and educational institutions in her four decades in practice. After relocating to the U.S. from Hong Kong at the age of 16, Annie earned her Bachelor of Architecture at the Southern California Institute of Architecture and her Master of Science and Advanced Building Design from Columbia. Since 1990, she has been a dedicated educator and lecturer in architecture and design schools across the country and abroad. She has also served on the City of LA Cultural Affairs Commission, the Mayor's Design Advisory Panel, um, among many other bodies, and I think uh, relevant for the conversation tonight, uh, many international and national design juries. Um, so we'll be talking with Annie about um, how we begin to think about the design selection process and what, what we might want this memorial, what kind of form or forms we might want this memorial to take. Annie, uh, welcome and thanks for being with us. Uh, our third panelist, uh, Michael Wu, was the first Asian American and the first trained urban planner. That often gets left out, and I'm glad that we're able to mark that tonight. Um, elected to the Los Angeles City Council. During his eight years representing the Hollywood area, he initiated the Hollywood Redevelopment Plan, played a key role in choosing the route and station locations of the Metro Red Line, now renamed the B Line, and launched the Hollywood Farmers Market. More recently, he was Dean of the College of Environmental Design at Cal Poly Pomona. So he too brings real insight about this intersection of policy and design work, which is so essential to what we'll be talking about this evening. And he represents the third generation of his family active in LA's Chinese American community. Michael, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. So let me give all of you um, a, a little sense of the run of show this evening, and let me thank the audience also. Let me thank all of you for joining us. This is, again, part of a remarkably diverse and wide-ranging series of programs that, uh, that CAM has put together, and we're really grateful for you spending a little bit of your Friday afternoon and evening with us. I will be talking a little bit about the origins of the Mayor's Office Civic Memory Working Group and um, the ways in which it is a precursor to the uh, 1871 Memorial Steering Committee. Um, so I'll do that first for 15 minutes or so, and then we'll move into talking about that steering committee and the work that we've been doing since, uh, since we first convened in July. So we'll talk about the role that each of our panelists has played uh, and talk a little bit about the discussions and deliberations that we had as a group. We'll talk then about some of the programming and temporary memorial work that we have been doing um, in line with the recommendations both of the Civic Memory Working Group and of this steering committee looking specifically at 1871, including a temporary memorial that's now on view at Union Station. Uh, and then we'll talk specifically about the recommendations uh, from the steering committee. Uh, those were released today and posted, um, added to the Civic Memory Working Group report. So we'll share the link for all of you so that you can uh, read along with us and we'll look at the specific five key recommendations that um, summarize what we heard from that steering committee, um, again, over uh, three months or so of work. Um, and then we will open it up to questions and discussion from all of you. Once we open the chat, we look forward to hearing from you. 
um, and we will certainly save some time for uh, for questions. So let me um, pull up a few images and I'll talk a little bit about the history of the um, of the Mayor's Office Civic Memory Working Group, as I mentioned. And this is really by way of suggesting um, the degree to which the, the working group was a precursor to all of the work that we'll be talking about this evening. In 2018, not long after I joined the mayor's office, after several years as architecture critic at the LA Times, I had a conversation with Mayor Garcetti about this very small plaque, which you may have seen um, uh, referred to in other conversations this week, which is sunk into the sidewalk along North Los Angeles Street in front of the Chinese American Museum. And it commemorates this event, which again, is one of the most <clears throat> violent and deadly days, not just in Los Angeles history, but in California and American history. And the mayor asked if there wasn't some more prominent way that we as a city could uh, honor the victims of the massacre and really begin to grapple uh, with um, this element of, uh, of our city's history that so many Angelinos have been unaware of. And that of, of course is far from the only part of Los Angeles history that remains buried. This is a photograph um, that we published in the report from 1932 of Central Station in downtown Los Angeles, a precursor to Union Station, which was um, completed a little bit later in the 1930s, showing some of the estimated 400,000, and some historians put the figure at well over a million, Mexican and Mexican-American residents of Southern California who were ordered to leave the country in the depths of the Depression for really no other offense than anxiety among Anglo uh, Angelinos in particular, that they would be a drain on resources during the Depression. And as with 1871, there are still many Angelinos who have never learned even the basic facts of this, uh, these events. In a larger sense, um, Los Angeles has been in love for a long time with our reputation as not just a city, but really the city of the future, a, a place that's always looking forward. So it was with all of that in mind that we convened the Mayor's Office Civic Memory Working Group, which included more than 50 historians and indigenous leaders, artists, architects, a number of uh, colleagues in city government and others to really explore one key question above all else, what new policies, outreach, or institutions might help the city commemorate its history more fully and accurately, especially where that history is fraught or has been whitewashed or buried, as, as I think is the case in both of those first examples that I shared, 1871 and, and the Mexican repatriation. Um, we started meeting when we still could in person uh, in the press room on the third floor of City Hall adjacent to the mayor's office. Uh, this is our first um, uh, meeting and we started to lay out um, a, a group of subcommittees to explore these questions and we were joined, as I mentioned, by a number of architects, designers, historians, and indigenous leaders, including Julia Bogany, sorry, this skips a little bit. Um, Julia Bogany, the uh, the Tongva cultural elder and leader who sadly passed away earlier this year. She was a, a key uh, voice in our in our first discussions of the uh, of the working group. And of course, by the end of 2019, when we first met, there was already beginning to be a national conversation about what to do with fraud or complicated or controversial monuments and memorials, um, most prominently, of course, uh, Confederate monuments across uh, much of the American South. And as we moved into 2020, um, of course, the world changed in all sorts of ways. First in January um, of last year, Kobe Bryant was killed unexpectedly in a helicopter crash along with his daughter and several others, and the outpouring of grief and the forms that it took in terms of ad hoc memorials around the city uh, really became a central point of discussion. These were uh, crowds of Angelinos that really, really did represent the demographics of the city and, and represented a real genuine outpouring of emotion. So we studied um, the, the form that those memorials um, uh, took uh, quite closely. And of course, the world continued to change across 2020 after the murder of George Floyd and the 
the marches and calls for racial uh, justice that we saw in Los Angeles as in so many other uh, cities. This is a photograph by Gary Leonard uh, of one of those marches that we also included in the civic memory uh, report. And we were lucky to have in our group a number of historians who have been studying just this question of whitewashing and erasure and forgetting, um, including Kelly Lytle Hernandez, uh, whose who's fantastic book, uh, City of Inmates, I recommend to you if you don't know it, and, uh, and Bill Deverell, historian at USC, and his book, uh, Whitewashed Adobe, which I also recommend if you, if you haven't read it. So that was very helpful in setting the, the framework, the kind of foundation for discussions about why Los Angeles has been so active in this kind of er erasure. And similarly, uh, we talked about the role that Hollywood has played um, in giving the world a, a skewed vision of Los Angeles and its community is a subject that is taken up in Tom Anderson's great documentary, Los Angeles Plays Itself. And ultimately, we produced uh, a report, a print report and a website entitled Past Due, Report and Recommendations of the Los Angeles Mayor's Office Civic Memory uh, Working Group in April of this year and the website where you can find uh, the full the full range of that material, including a, a, a PDF, downloadable PDF of the report in full is all at civicmemory.la. Um, and in, on April 15th of this year, the mayor um, uh, marked the release of the report and endorsed its recommendations in an event that included many of our, the leaders of this effort, including Rostin Wu, uh, who's at middle right there, who's been a key figure um, in our conversations around the 1871 uh, memorial. And just want to give uh, a quick shout out to um, Silas Monroe, who's pictured at bottom left here as the designer from Polymode, who led the design team, which really um, gave uh, shape to the report and its recommendations. So the themes um, that we focused on really started with an idea that the city has for too long acted as a gatekeeper when it comes to choosing which events um, are commemorated and marked in public space in particular, and that the city might be might better think of its role as a facilitator. We really focused quite a bit on process and community outreach in ways that we'll talk about later this evening. And we, um, we really wanted the report not to be a set of prescriptive blueprints, but really something we ended up describing as a packet of seeds, a kind of guidebook to help frame more equitable processes um, related to these subjects, um, particularly commemoration, memorial design, renaming and removal um, and related subjects. So a number of that work uh, is moving forward uh, with with real urgency. One category is memorials to victims of, uh, of the pandemic, both permanent and ephemeral. We're looking ahead to events uh, later this fall, as well as a, a permanent memorial. We have been working to take reparative steps in terms of our relationship with indigenous communities. And some of you may have heard the announcements that we made uh, last week on Indigenous Peoples Day. The mayor uh, made an apology to native communities as well as announcing plans to rename Father Sarah Park uh, very close to the location of the, of the memorial of the 1871 violence that we'll be talking about, as well as developing uh, land easement or co-management agreements with uh, tribal leaders at that site and others ultimately around the city, as well as, of course, the memorial that we'll be talking about this evening to the victims of the 1871 uh, massacre. We have also uh, continued to do public events and outreach related to the report and its recommendations. This is a, um, a USC Dornsife Third LA series um, event that we uh, produced a couple of months after the report was released, looking at um, uh, work beyond uh, indigenous land acknowledgement that the city can be um, can be at work on to meaningfully support indigenous communities. And we have had a remarkable reception um, um, and reaction to the report, uh, not just in Los Angeles, but um, around the country. This is from a piece that appeared in the Washington Post. Uh, in May, a month or so after the uh, Civic Memory Working Group report was released. Um, and just today, uh, Carolina Miranda, we'll put a link to this story in the chat, um, has a piece on Civic Memory um, Working Group, the work of the 1871 Steering Committee, uh, as well as uh, an audit from Monument Lab um, looking nationally at the what it calls the commemorative landscape. And, 
Um, she, um, uh, in this really thoughtful piece, um, had had some fantastic things to say about about the report. Um, and I think the way in which the report leads into ways that we have framed the Chinese uh, massacre discussions is really important um, and something that that she also called out in her piece in terms of how we are, again, thinking of ourselves uh, on the city side uh, as getting out of the way to a certain extent, um, um, being less of a gatekeeper, being more of a resource, being more of a facilitator. And I was particularly pleased at this line in her piece. We really wanted this Civic Memory Working Group report to be um, an unusual hybrid. We wanted it to be um, uh, full of, of, of serious policy recommendations and paths forward in terms of the work that the city could do, but we also wanted it to be worth reading um, as an as a editorial document, a literary document, and um, we were encouraged to see that Carolina um, noticed that as well. And this comes at a time when uh, groups, I think particularly Monument Lab, which is based in Philadelphia, has been leading similar work around the country and with support from the uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Monument Lab has just completed uh, um, what it calls a national monument audit, which looked at the landscape of, uh, of monuments and memorials around the country. And I recommend this report to you as well as the, uh, the webinar that was um, uh, organized and recorded just a, just a couple of weeks ago, which is uh, looking at a lot of very similar themes. I wanna close this portion of the program by reading um, a quote from Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, which was one of the inspirations for us as we did this work. And she writes in that book, we in the developed world are like, sorry, I have to um, move my little screen out of the way. We in the developed world are like homeowners who inherited a house on a piece of land that is beautiful on the outside, but whose soil is unstable loam and rock, heaving and contracting over generations cracks patched, but the deeper ruptures waved away for decades, centuries even. Many people may rightly say, I had nothing to do with how this all started. I have nothing to do with the sins of the past. My ancestors never attacked indigenous people, never owned slaves. Whoops. And yes, not one of us was here when this house was built. Our immediate ancestors may have had nothing to do with it. But here we are, the current occupants of a property with stress cracks and bowed walls and fissures built into the foundation. We are the heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We did not erect the uneven pillars or joists, but they are ours to deal with now. And any further deterioration is in fact on our hands. And I think the way that um, Isabel Wilkerson frames those questions as a response to those who would say, what responsibility to, do I bear as an Angelino for an event that happened 150 years ago? I think this is a very powerful reminder of the obligation that all of us um, share. And we have certainly moved forward in the 1871 uh, memorial work um, with, with, those words, uh, with those words in mind. So I would encourage all of you who have questions about how you can take part, how you can help as we move the memorial work that you'll be hearing about now forward or with any other aspects of the 1871 uh, related work or the Mayor's Office Civic Memory Working Group um, initiatives, please be in touch with me directly. Um, and I would really look forward to, to hearing from you. So now we're going to move specifically into a discussion about uh, this steering committee. It numbered in the end um, about 70 Chinese American uh, civic, business and cultural leaders, as well as architects, designers, um, curators and a number of city officials with real expertise, again, in this intersection uh, of, uh, of urban design and public art. Um, all of which will be really key to making sure that we can execute the memorial uh, and ensure its success over um, not just when it's new, but over over many decades. Um, so, so I really look forward to sharing with you some of those conversations that we've had. And I wanted to start this portion of of the panel by asking each of our speakers to just share 
uh, with the group a little bit about your experience on the on the steering committee, um, the specific conversations that you focused on, um, the subcommittees perhaps that you that you served on uh, or led before we get into some broader questions about the themes and issues that we grappled with as a group. So let me start. Uh, let me start with Michael. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, uh, let me begin by saying that um, uh, I was born and raised in LA, but never ever heard a word about this massacre as I was growing up. Uh, our parents never mentioned it to my sisters and me. It was never brought up in school. Um, you never heard it, you never saw it in the media or in history books. People just didn't know about it. Uh, and um, I myself did not hear about the massacre until nine years ago when uh, the LA Times book review uh, invited me to write a review of Scott Zesch's book, um, The Chinatown War. Um, that was literally the first time I ever heard of it. Um, and it had a, a big impression on me. I had no idea that lynchings like that happened in Los Angeles. But then uh, I didn't do anything about it. It sort of faded in my mind. And it wasn't until the last couple of years when the, the wave of anti-Asian sentiment grew nationally, especially in political discourse. And then the shootings in Atlanta earlier this year um, and the other sporadic violence against Asian Americans in cities around the country, I think really galvanized the attention of many Asian Americans that something's going on here. And uh, uh, it was actually in an article by Shelby Grad in the LA Times in March, in which he pointed out, he, he drew a connection between the 1871 massacre and the violence against Asian Americans in 2021 um, that, that got my attention and made me think I need to get involved somehow uh, to do something about this. And it just so happened that this was around the time when the Civic Memory Working Group was concluding its, its work. And so in other words, for me, there was a kind of convergence of the past and the present coming together. And so um, that's why I felt compelled to get involved and was, uh, I, I have two impressions um, from the discussions over the last few months. One is that many people react to hearing the story of the massacre by saying, why didn't I hear about this before? But the other impression is that upon hearing about it, many people feel compelled to do something. And so uh, there's something positive that can come out of this. Thank you, Michael. And I should note that Michael is one of the five co-chairs of the of the eighteen seventy one Memorial Steering Committee, along with along with Jessica and three others. Um, Annie, let's turn to you next and and hear about the role that you've played in these discussions. I want to follow up with uh, what Michael had just said. When we actually heard about this, you know, like many of us, after Black Lives Matter, uh, we're aware more so about all the different um, you know, racist history in our country that's been buried under the rocks. And you know, while I was reading Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong, uh, Michael approached me about this. And so I felt very compelled to be part of the committee and I put myself into the design committee. Um, and I think that in acknowledgement of something you said earlier, um, Christopher, about why it's taken so long. You know, the Chinese culture, especially the older generation, has a tendency to conceal bad memories because we were building a brand of what Chinese people are in this society. And in order to focus on the collective accomplishment of the race, these things were always suppressed. So. But now that we are in this period where we really are dealing with self-reckoning of ourselves, reflection and stuff, this is really a kind of important role. Um, so during the steering committee, I think what we talked about particularly is a kind of participatory democratic process of how to 
come to a, a decision on what memorial to build. And by memorial, we acknowledge, just as the title of this panel today, the word shape is really important because we are helping to shape collective memory and whatever symbols this memorial will, will take place, it's gonna be an effort to transform the acceptance of communities um, and hopefully be beyond just tolerance, but more of a kind of uh, a, a place within the city where people can actually be self-reflective. Um, you know, I thought about one memorial to bring up as a kind of possible uh, kind of example, but before I do that, our committee also decided that we need to create a level playing field because so often on these design competitions, the, those who have more resources, larger design firms uh, such as that, will have more resources to create very sort of engaging and, and lots of uh, you know, uh, presentation, like even that would attract people, but at the same time, then you have smaller groups or maybe even groups that are not related to design, but may have great ideas who cannot access the kind of resources to bring these very sort of professional and engaging uh, products, you know, to that competition process. So our steering committee, and I think Christopher is gonna address what the steering committee's uh, recommendation would be, uh, it will be a level of, of the playing field process uh, in terms of a request for information rather than a request for proposal, which is generally how design uh, competitions go. But lastly, I wanted to say that there was a, um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, because of the Boston uh, Marathon bombing, one of the MIT campus police by the name of Sean Collier was uh, killed and the college decided to put together a memorial and a, a firm called Haller and Yoon in Boston created this memorial, which I thought was a very uh, apt sort of example for us. It has both monumentality and intimacy. It has openness and shelter. Uh, there's many levels of engagement, multi-sensory, so you don't have to read, you can just feel, and it makes you think about things like while you're in that space. And then, uh, so my hope is that uh, when we get to the point in 2022, when these RFI go out, uh, that you know we'll be able to engage with those who will help us break this conspiracy of silence and create that kind of presence of absence, right, in the city um, to really kind of talk about uh, the sentiment of our collective values at this point in time. Thank you so much, Annie, and you've touched on so many of the important uh, themes and, and tensions um, in, in this effort, thinking about how to balance um, soliciting design ideas from uh, a national and, and international pool of designers while also really thinking about carefully about community input locally and, as you said, um, trying to level the playing field in terms of um, smaller and larger firms. And we'll, we'll certainly get back to that. But I was really impressed by the, the thoughtfulness and the nuance of the recommendations from the design selection group that was thinking in particular about the process that we might follow and how we might move away from um, either poll uh, that is typical in this process. On the one hand, a, a very sort of bureaucratic RFP um, that doesn't have a lot of flexibility on the one hand or a, an op completely open international design competition on the other, but something that's sort of a hybrid and, and pays attention to all of those issues that you raised. Um, thanks, Annie. Uh, Jessica. Thanks, Christopher. And um, thank you for your leadership um, on the entire working group. Um, and for the report that's gone live today. And, and thank you also to the team at the Chinese American Museum for helping put, it, put together a tremendous program. Um, I'm involved in uh, the 1871 Chinese Memorial work um, through the program and outreach uh, subcommittee, which was really uh, an idea 
brought forth by Rostin Wu, who's my co-chair, um, because when the proposals initially came forward about kind of these different work streams that we needed to dedicate um, time and people to really thinking about, especially the process, um, it was a recommendation that he made. And, and I really credit him for that. And I also credit, uh, again, the, the mayor's office and Christopher and all the co-chairs for having a process that is iterative and, um, and inclusive. Uh, because even though uh, the process that you heard that Annie mentioned for the, the design and um, be the RFI, uh, we have been taking feedback, um, both good and bad, this entire time. And I think I, I can't understate that enough that uh, everyone has been welcome to the table who's wanted to join to listen in. Um, and just the fact that we're having a conversation today in the making of the memorial, I hope um, gives comfort to people listening how uh, inclusive we're trying to be while at the same time trying to center the Chinese uh, American experience about what happened uh, 150 years ago. And uh, for me personally, uh, one of the reasons how I got uh, looped into this work was actually um, in, in March um, after the horrific shootings uh, that happened in Atlanta where um, eight people were victims of a shooter that went around to different spas, um, a number of which of those victims were uh, Asian women. And so this um, came at the height and I think was really um, a big spark in a lot of the conversations and a lot of the media articles that happened thereafter about the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. And I got involved in this because that was something that I knew I needed to take ownership and leadership of uh, with the, the mayor's support. We have our own internal anti-Asian hate working group, which I help lead. And uh, uh, a few weeks later, um, the report from the Civic Memory Working Group uh, was released in April. And even before the shooting that happened in March, um, this was one of the very first recommendations in that report, um, was, was commemorating what happened 150 years ago. And I think uh, these two different work groups uh, just made us ask, um, uh, me ask myself, like, how do they relate, right? How does the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes uh, relate to what happened 150 years ago? And so it's very much uh, this common thread in our history of how do we prevent future attacks from happening? And, and a big part of that is really understanding and reckoning um, things that we haven't um, quite talked about and, and, and revealed uh, as part of our, our uh, anti-Asian history in, in Los Angeles. And so that's how I got involved in the, the programming piece of it um, was really critical because we want everyone to be involved, as I mentioned. Um, we've been doing programming um, for uh, the past week. Um, last week, we started off and kicked off um, a, a much bigger discussion about what this means. Um, about why um, everybody needs to care and understand what's at stake, because I really think that the process and the committee model um, that we have can really be a blueprint for how we do work for other uh, memorials and grappling with other histories from other communities um, in the future. And so that's what um, makes me really happy to be to be part of this work. I am a Filipino American. Uh, I'm not Chinese American, and and I think that's really important to state because you don't have to be uh, Chinese to uh, support or be part of this work. Uh, actually, you have a, a, a duty to support this work because for me, I see it as how do we um, restore. Uh, missing pages of our history book. Uh, and that's kind of how I felt when I learned about this incident. And I think uh, most communities, if not every community, has that same sentiment or feeling about something that happened in their community that has never been fully acknowledged 
or uh, realized. And so if we can't start here about something that happened 150 years ago, it's going to be hard to move on all the other pieces. And so we um, you know, need to, to all work together and come to the table about um, this memorial. And, and it sounds like, uh, Christopher, you have your hands full because we're going to be working through your report <laughs> and all these recommendations you made because they're coming to life um, thanks to you and through our media support. I can't thank them enough for, for everyone who's covering this. So that was a very long answer, but... <laughs> no, that's, that's really, really helpful. And I'm so glad in particular that you talked in depth about two things that I wanted to touch on as well the um, the connections to anti-Asian violence and the ways in which um, these are these continue to be not just urgent questions but an urgent um, uh, kind of necessity to protect against these attacks and educate um, to try to move past them and I think that was something that was on the minds of all of us as we were doing this work over the course of the summer and into the fall. And the other, in terms of the structure, it is it is really important to point out, as you did, that we tried to be open um, to reordering the structure as we went. So in, in the early discussions, we thought we might want to have three subcommittees looking at, you know, what what um, uh, what sites might be appropriate for this memorial uh, first, second, the design selection process that I mentioned. Would we have a competition? Would we would we pursue some other model? And then for what we called funding approaches, thinking about the potential mix of, of uh, public and private funds, um, private and philanthropic donations, and looking at some other models of memorials in terms of their budgets, in terms of where they had found support um, to finance uh, these particularly ambitious memorials of the kind that we're thinking of here. Um, and then, as you mentioned, Jessica Rostin Wu, who was a member originally of the Civic Memory Working Group as well, suggested that we really need to be thinking about a fourth a set of questions having to do with programming and outreach, and I think made a very compelling argument that programming in particular, both between now and the time that a memorial is complete, but not just in that period, also once a memorial is in place, also thinking about the ways that we could activate that memorial in terms of programming, in terms of thinking about maintenance, um, in terms of thinking about the extended life of a memorial and not thinking that there's just one moment in time when we cut the ribbon and that's when we pay attention to it, that in the lead up, which may be, um, you know, significant time before this memorial is completed, given the work ahead of us, and then once it's in place, the importance of community outreach and programming um, to bring different shades of, of meaning and history to the question. Uh, of, of how to mark this event. And that was really something we tried to be clear about from the beginning. We f convened first in July. We knew we wanted to release these recommendations this week before the anniversary on Sunday. And we really wanted to be practical about what we might accomplish. So we knew that we certainly wouldn't have a design um, uh, ready to unveil in such a short amount of time. But we also didn't, even if we had had more time, frankly, we didn't want to be prescriptive that was very much the spirit of the Civic Memory Working Group um, as well, which is to say um, we really wanted to avoid a dynamic where the city handpicks a designer who then sort of imposes a vision on a community. Um, we wanted to think about the most important issues that we needed to grapple with and make some preliminary recommendations to move this progress, uh, this process forward in a productive and as you mentioned, Jessica, as inclusive a way as we could. So I think those are those are two really important points, and I'm glad that you mentioned both of them. Um, I'm curious. This is a question for all of you. As as we think about this backdrop, um, the fact that that the city has never um, officially commemorated this event beyond the plaque that we saw an image of, and beyond the work that the Chinese American Museum, but certainly for, from in terms of the the city government as a whole, and I can I'll start with you, Michael, on this one. What, what do you think accounts for in a city that has built other memorials, other monuments, certainly? Um, uh, why this one stayed in the shadows, as it were? Well, Christopher, I think there are at least a couple of reasons to point to. Uh, Annie alluded to this earlier, which is I think there is sometimes a tendency among Chinese Americans and Asian Americans to uh, not be loud about complaining. Uh, I mean, uh, 
Confucius was not known for holding press conferences. And if anything, it was considered more noble to be stoical, hold it back and, you know, don't rush to the microphone to complain. Uh, so I think there, there, even among those who did know about the massacre, there may have been some tendency to not want to bring it up because there's no, there were, because of an assumption there would be no good from bringing up negative stories that make people feel bad. I think that's part of it. Also, uh, I think that the narrative about the massacre collided with LA's tendency to be a self booster. That is the traditional civic booster image of LA being a city of the future. Uh, it doesn't really fit to dwell on uh, uh, tragedies or atrocities of the past. So I think that's part of it too. But uh, as you pointed out in your presentation, nationally, I think there's a trend to reappraise how we recognize history with physical places and the coming down of Confederate general statues or reappraisals about slavery or lynching or mistreatment of indigenous peoples. In a way, what's unfolding now in Los Angeles with this project, in a way, is, is a West Coast version of these discussions that are happening nationally. So even though telling the story of the massacre doesn't fit the booster image of LA and sort of contradicts the tendency of Asians to, to hold it in rather than, rather than vocally complain, I think that what we're seeing now is an historic change. Annie, do you have thoughts on that question? Yeah. I. I think that, you know, I think not to dwell more on this because I also go straight to like, where are the Chinese putting their money, you know, and it's going to like really showcase places like the Huntington Chinese Garden and stuff. Because when you think about the story, if you just told someone the story and just said, okay, 19 people got killed. I mean, that number seems not so significant, right? But compared to the population at that time, as you mentioned, that's 10% of the population. And that roughly also about 10% of Los Angelinos were participating in, in that um, kind of lynching and riot. Which is a time. really shocking statistic that I did not know before yeah. we began this process. And then, you know, like it, when you think about it, and as someone posted, I think, um, Taylor, you, you posted this thing about on chat about the 300 roundup towns, right? Uh, that is part of the Chinese Exclusion Act. This is directly linked to it. This is the legacy of that lynching. It's not just this incident, but the entire Chinese Exclusion Act and what happened, Mencenar, you know, again. And it brings back a, a particular, I would say, a kind of a burden, an ethnic burden. Because, uh, and that's something that, you know, um, in the book, Minor Feelings, we talked about, you know, we were model citizens in a way, we were white adjacent, which pitched us against um, black Americans uh, because it seems that we have better treatment, but at the same time, all of us who have this Asian face would be at some point in our lives say, where are you from? You know, so we'll always be the other. So I think, in this Chinese massacre memorial, I think we can get, you know, that whole issue out in the open, right? People who don't look like what you know, even white right or black Americans, uh, you know, how do you, how do you actually come together to a kind of moment of peace and justice and reconciliation, right? And how can we teach this to the next generation? Um, how can we as Jessica said earlier, why should you care right, about that? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, these are all the questions that we were we were working through. Um, it's amazing how time is flying by. I think uh, we should move now into a, a brief discussion of some of the programming and outreach that we did ahead of the release of the report. And I think these, as Jessica said, these were real models of suggesting the way in which we wanted to work, the posture that we wanted to take toward community engagement and openness um, to input. And that's something that absolutely continues. Uh, we had, as I mentioned, 70 plus members of the steering committee, but we have such a larger community that we're interested in continuing to hear from. 
um, and the two um, initiatives that I wanted to to call all of our attention to are, are, are very much produced along along those lines. So the first is actually I noticed that there is a a link in the chat, so I would call your attention to that. Um, that's the Broken News um, Temporary Memorial, which is on view through the end of the month at Union Station in the main waiting room. So if you're walking from Alameda toward the back, um, uh, toward the goal line, for example, you will pass it. It will be on your right in the large uh, uh, hall uh, where Metro Art often uh, has exhibitions and other kinds uh, uh, of presentations. And it is a, um, a proposal for a memorial, actually, that was produced in a class that Rostin Wu, who we've already talked about, um, uh, led at Art Center College looking at um, the 1871 massacre. And it looks at the climate of anti-Chinese and anti-Asian sentiment, which we've been talking about already, that set the stage for the violence and then continued uh, to be the foundation for things like the, the Chinese Exclusion Act and the other um, uh, acts of discrimination that followed the massacre. Um, so I uh, encourage all of you to look at that, um, at, at that link um, in the chat and to visit uh, Broken News. So it consists of a number of um, newspaper front pages, some um, um, authentic and historical and others imagined. Um, to tell the story of the, the larger kind of cultural context that gave rise to the, the violence in 1871. Um, really remarkable as a kind of, um, as a kind of temporary memorial that begins to bring attention both to the events and also I think uh, this was a real focus in terms of how we thought about the presentation of Broken News. Um, the, the 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 programming that that uh, that Cam has been doing um, this week, and so I want to give uh, credit to Rostin Wu um, and um, Eugene Moy, who is an advisor, along with Rostin to the project, as well as David Louie, who's one of the co-chairs of our steering committee, who is really uh, one of the key figures who made this who made this happen. In addition, we did have an event on October fourteenth. And uh, that Jessica was really uh, key in spearheading. So Jessica, I just wanted to give you a chance to talk about it a little bit. And while you're doing that, I'll, I'll share my screen again and show a screenshot of, of that event. Great, thanks, Christopher. Um, I mean, one of the things that we did in the programming committee and our members of the committee are so diverse and they pull from so many different industries, the public sector, the private sector, their architects and designers. Uh, we even have a rapper who's incredible, Jason, who moderated this. And the question really was, how do we all come together to uh, broaden the conversation around what happened 150 years ago? And this is what we came up with. And it's uh, really uncovering LA's anti-Asian history and really centering it uh, around what we can do today. So being action oriented about how to support um, efforts on anti-Asian hate, how to support the Chinese American Museum, which is um, located in the heart of El Pueblo, which is where our city was founded. Um, so that space um, is, is just, a mar just a part of um, the Latino community. It is the Chinese and Asian American community. And so we wanted to just uh, share that again with people who may not know. And that's a great screenshot of uh, our panel. So we have uh, representatives there from uh, all uh, various levels of government from Supervisor Solis's office. Uh, we have Arturo from El Pueblo, which is a city department. And um, uh, Manju, who is a city commissioner, as well as uh, one of the co-founders of Stop AAPI Hate. And uh, again, really grounded in why it was relevant for today in this discussion, because we know that uh, hate in general is uh, on the rise. And it's not uh, a passive action that people think about. And it's just 
you know, something that's kept uh, internal to certain people or groups. We know that hate is being manifested in a lot of different organizations and communities, and it's manifesting into racial violence. Um, much in the same way that happened in, in 1871. And so that's why uh, we hosted that and also to talk about uh, the programming uh, put forth this week by the Chinese American Museum. And so there'll be some links in the chat um, about uh, the remaining programming days as well as how to support future efforts. So I hope if you're listening and you're watching that this resonates with you and um, that uh, we need your support to make sure that we deliver this memorial and future memorials for, for so many other communities. Thank you so much, Jessica. And we'll move now into a more specific discussion of the steering committee's report and recommendations. And I'll just give you a sense also of how to navigate it within the larger civic memory uh, working group. Um, so we'll go through the recommendations and I would encourage the panelists um, to jump in with any thoughts as I sort of take us through, um, take us through the basics. Give me one second. So again, with, with thanks to Polymode, the design team who was able to add this report and series of recommendations to the past due website. So the link to this particular page has already been shared in the chat. Um, but if you were to go to the main past due um, uh, homepage here, uh, which is just civicmemory.la, as I mentioned, there are a couple of other ways that you can find it. If you click on subcommittees, for example, um, you will see a photograph of one of the walking tours that we that we led when we were looking at potential uh, potential sites. And and thanks to to Michael Wu, who is really key in organizing those. And if then then if you click on that photograph, it'll take you back to the page that we were just looking at, which includes uh, the report of this um, of this what ended up being about 70 member uh, steering committee, which met uh, in full three times over the summer, as well as um, about a dozen uh, subcommittee uh, meetings on top of that. So as I mentioned, we were very uh, pleased and privileged to have um, five remarkable co-chairs, uh, Jessica, Felicia Filer, who runs the um, public art programs for the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, David Louis, a El Pueblo, longtime El Pueblo commissioner who you heard about already, uh, our panelist Michael and, and Dr. Gay Yuan, um, uh, president of the Board of Friends of the Chinese American Museum, who has been, of course, spearheading the events of this, uh, of this week. So we start with an executive summary that gives some of the background um, of the event itself. And I would encourage you uh, to read through these details at your leisure. We won't go through all of them, of course, in, in this event. But I did want to focus on these key recommendations and, and go through each of them in turn, because I think they're important for setting the context of where we go from here. And again, very important to stress that we did not want to be prescriptive at this stage. We did not want to foreclose possibilities. Um, we wanted to grapple with we thought what we thought were the key questions uh, and make recommendations about how to move the process forward in, a, in the most uh, most productive way. So the first recommendation has to do with a question that we spent a good deal of time um, uh, discussing, in fact, which was whether we should have uh, one site for the memorial, whether it should instead be a kind of distributed memorial that features a kind of constellation of sites. And we ended up focusing on something in between, which is we had very strong support in the steering committee for this notion that we should have one primary and, and prominently visible site that might be suitable for gathering and introspection um, and special events, along with a number of supporting secondary sites that might be linked as a walking tour might be supported by wayfinding, signage, digital technology, or audio content, the, the way that um, uh, many memorials are being activated these days to tell the full story of the ways in which the massacre played out. And that's important, not just be, for the sites of violence, but also, and, and Michael Wu has been really key in helping us understand this, the sites of sanctuary also. As Chinese fled uh, the, the sites of the most intense violence on October 24th, 1871, there were some Angelinos who opened up their properties, their businesses, 
and their land as sites of sanctuary um, to give refuge uh, to, to those Chinese who are fleeing the violence. Um, so we think there's a role to play in, in looking at some of those other sites as well, but there was very strong support for the idea that we have one primary site. Second, um, we did consider a number of sites uh, and the preferred site for the primary location uh, is not very far actually from where that plaque is located that we've been talking about, the wide sidewalk along the north side of North Los Angeles Street um, along, you know, it's not quite cardinal directions there, but along the southern or eastern edge of, of CAM, which is quite near the location of the most intense violence. Um, and that site has some things um, um, really going for it, in, including the width of the sidewalk, the fact that there are mature trees already there providing some shade, adjacency to CAM, because we think this memorial really is key in continuing to spotlight the, um, the programming that CAM is doing and should be thought of very much in, in, uh, in conjunction with um, efforts uh, thinking about audiences at CAM, as well as visiting uh, the memorial itself. Um, it's under full public control. It's, uh, it's just south and therefore not part of the Alameda and Los Angeles Street Esplanade project, which is part of the redesign of the Union Station forecourt. So it had a number of, um, of elements going for it, but there were, um, in the report, we mentioned a number of other locations that also had support from members of the committee, but this is the one that was the, uh, the, the clear favorite. Third, again, we, uh, we talked about this idea of uh, how we might solicit um, designs. And as Annie described quite well, um, we settled on this idea of a request for ideas, which would come from the city uh, next year. Um, and that we would be very careful at the beginning um, not to ask too much in terms of deliverables in the first round. So we really want the first round of proposals to be about ideas and concepts rather than on really polished renderings or images, which is the kind of requirement that might make it, might privilege larger firms with more resources. And then an important second part of this idea of a level playing field is that once we came up with a short list of artists, designers, or teams that had very strong conceptual ideas, whether they were individuals or, or parts of teams, that we would then um, offer a stipend to those designers to further develop their proposals, as well as the opportunity to present them in public forums. Um, and we think this discussion, this presentation in public of the shortlisted ideas at an early stage will be another key part of this outreach uh, and community input process um, to really make this a citywide and community-wide conversation about what this memorial might look like. Um, and as we've mentioned uh, in, in other forums, there is $250,000 already set aside by the city uh, to fund these early stages of the process. And so uh, we were very gratified by, again, the nuance and thoughtfulness of, of those conversations. Fourth, and this is admittedly, I think, uh, where we have the most work ahead of us, thinking about the uh, organizational structure to oversee the fundraising and the implementation, uh, and whether that is a new nonprofit, an existing nonprofit or community group, um, in coordination with certain city departments who have experience in doing kind of uh, this kind of work. We want to be very careful that we are uh, building capacity of local um, organizations without overwhelming those organizations when it comes time uh, to help us lead the fundraising efforts. And so we have some very clear next steps um, spelled out in terms of how we might um, how we might look into um, uh, answering those questions. And then finally, this comes again from the recommendations that the Programming and Outreach Subcommittee was really focusing on and the and the points that Ross and Wu so importantly raised early in the process, which is to say in recommendation number five, as important as the form of the memorial at the primary site is, equally important is a strategy and sufficient funding from the beginning to coordinate related programming before, as I mentioned, and after the memorial is dedicated, as well as ongoing maintenance of both physical and digital elements. And this is something that a lot of members of the steering committee who have experience um, uh, building new memorials uh, really underscored for us that um, digital elements require maintenance as well. And sometimes they 
um, uh, can um, can fall out of, of repair more quickly than physical, given how much um, platforms are delivering digital information are continually changing. Um, and the programming could include temporary installations or mobile commemorations, and we looked into the history of some of those commemorations. Um, so those are the five uh, recommendations, and I just want to pause here um, to open it up to the panel to if they want to jump in with thoughts about any or all of those now that we have taken um, the, the, the group through those. Sure, I can start. Um, sure. Thank you for going over the report recommendations hot off the digital press um, literally just a few hours ago. So thank you for, for all your work on that. Um, I also meant to mention this earlier, but thank you to, to LA Metro for their support of the temporary exhibit um, of broken use because um, it's a really important, as Christopher mentioned, important deliverable that we can point to. Um, to slowly tie in the pieces of all of our work. But um, I would say that if I could leave some uh, last words for our viewers uh, and some closing words, and I'm gonna quote the, the mayor here in one of the steering committees that he joined us with, but that we should really use this opportunity of, of uh, what happened 150 years ago, not just to mark history, but to make history. And that it's an opportunity for us to all come at the table and to unify um, about what we think about as our values as a city, um, our values of inclusion uh, and what it means to fully grapple with uh, what happened and the other discussions that it will naturally open uh, with other communities, especially communities of color. And so uh, I hope everyone here who's listening and watching gets more involved. Uh, Christopher kindly broadcasted his email on one of his PowerPoint decks. So he is very accessible, as I know um, the entire CAM staff are, and I am, and all the panelists are here. So um, it's a really incredible project and the more community involvement that we have, um, I feel like it's really the, the heartbeat of the project because uh, we're able to say that this is what the community wants and we uh, took all ideas into consideration and you can't say that for most projects, let alone most memorials. So thank you everyone for, for watching and tuning in. I just wanna oh. add, um, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. Okay, Go ahead. I just want to add that, you know, the, like you said, Jessica, the heartbeat, I think these community interaction and the conversation we'll have and the, you know, the whole rollout of all the processes is going to be the one of the most important work that is being done. And hopefully, uh, even the nature of the memorial and whoever decide to do it will have that kind of sense of education in mind uh, so that it's not just about commemorating, you know, the loss in the community It's not just communicating the anti-racist uh, sentiment that happened during that time or even bubbling during this time on the surface, but it's more like, what are we gonna do in a positive sense to, bring a, a kind of more unified um, presence, you know, how can we unite people? And if it, if it can be leveraged, if this platform of this project can be leveraged towards that evolution, I think it would have done its best job. Well, Christopher, I wanted to tell the audience that if anybody out there wants to hear more about the story of the massacre itself, or would, would be interested in seeing the sites of the massacre, I recommend that you watch the new video documentary called Buried History that was just premiered yesterday. It was written and produced by Elaine Wu, directed by uh, Cameron Lee Wong with research and artwork by John Lee Wong, who happened to be my sister, nephew and brother-in-law, but they did a great job and their video is available for free on YouTube. Uh, and, and in closing, all I would say is there's a cliche that goes around in politics about how you shouldn't let a crisis go to waste. I think 
for Los Angeles in 2021, the byword is you shouldn't let a tragedy go to waste. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and I, as we move into audience questions, I would encourage all of you to uh, add questions and comments in the chat. Um, and I wanted to call actually on one of our steering committee members, Pamela Tom. I'm not sure if she's able to um, unmute herself and show herself um, and share remarkable historical detail that she shared with the group earlier today. Um, and if and if we don't um, hear from Pamela, I'm happy to re uh, read that myself. But I wanted to give um, you a chance to do it, Pamela, if if you're if you're able. Uh, she said she's not. I don't know if the organizers can allow her to unmute herself. Otherwise, I'm happy to to read it. I'll just give them a second to see if that's possible. Okay. Um, let me see if I could, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I can also be seen. Um, all right, well, maybe you can't see me, but can, if you can hear me. That's yes, fine. we can hear you, so please okay. go ahead. And all I, right, I yeah, I'll just be quick. I sure. just, to, to Michael's point about um, the Chinese having this reputation of being uh, whatever, stoic and not responding to acts of violence or discrimination, I found uh, there was, okay, let's start my video. There was a dissertation by Raymond Liu. It was his UC Irvine PhD dissertation, and it was called The Chinese American Community of Los Angeles, 1870 to 1900, A Case of Resistance, Organization, and Participation. And I found something really remarkable. He said that within weeks of the massacre, Merchants and residents demanded from the city payment, from the city payment or property damage suffered at the hands of Anglo rioters. A man named Wing Chung presented a request to the city council to settle losses of $6,530.34 incurred by his business. Wing was adamant in his demand, and when the council delayed, Wing sued for damages. And he goes on to say that the carnage did not affect the residents' desire for fair treatment and their disdain for discriminatory treatment. Additionally, in early 1872, 14 out of 15 laundry owners refused to pay a license tax that had been levied by the city council. So I just think it's really important to know that as, you know, even as early as 1871 at the height of Chinese uh, discrimination, that the Chinese were still resisting and and, and really seeking justice. So I, I just wanted to point that out. And I think it's important to recognize that um, today. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's another example of the ways in which new scholarship continues to inform the work that we're doing on this. Um, you know, this is an event, as we've discussed, that happened 150 years ago. And yet there has been fresh scholarship that has emerged even in the time that the, the few months uh, that the steering committee has been at work and 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 the details that Pamela shared are, are part of that. Um, and that continues to really add to, I think, the richness of the um, of the discussions. Let me go back to a couple of um, questions from the from the chat. Um, one from Victor Ju from earlier. Can you locate this current moment, both the 150th commemoration of the 1871 massacre and the city's civic memory work within the history of the Los Angeles moment, a moment from the 1990s that we associate with Mike Davis's City of Courts and Dolores Hayden's Power of Place, as well as the many trenchant comments about LA being a place of forgetting? <laughs> is the LA, is the Los Angeles school now a policy presence in the city? Um, I will say, thank you for that question. Um, I will say that Dolores Hayden's work was a, a very much a touchstone uh, at many parts of the civic memory uh, work. Um, many of the subcommittees, many elements of the report um, look back to uh, power of place in particular. Um, and I think the I think the city of courts and the other work you mentioned from the Los Angeles School was an important foundation. Um, and I think we really were 
um, grappling with the question of what our generation or generation's responsibility was to this history. There had been really remarkable analyses of these um, going back, of course, beyond um, uh, before, well, before the 1990s, Kerry McWilliams and, and his uh, book, An Island on the Land, uh, which I also recommend to our audience if they don't know it from 1946 as a study of this tendency in the Los Angeles sensibility of forgetting of or, or amnesia is another important um, sort of touchstone for us. Christopher, I would add that uh, in response to this question, there are at least a couple of ways in which the 1871 massacre really is a precursor of other violence that happened, both as a precursor of uh, other anti-Chinese violence that happened in California and throughout the West. Uh, one historian has found that there have been at least 200, there were at least 200 forced expulsions of Chinese from towns in California in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, plus there've been other things like the terrible massacre of Chinese miners in Wyoming. So one way to think about 1871 is that it set the stage for a lot of anti-Chinese violence for decades. Decades. But another way to look at it is Los Angeles in terms of 1871 being a, being a precursor of the periodic eruptions of racial violence that took place in LA, whether we're talking about the Zoot Suit riots in 1943 or the 65 Watts, Watts riots, or more recently, 1992. Um, uh, something that's much more visible and vivid to people who are around today. So I think there are at least a couple of ways to think of 1871, either predicting the violence that happened against the Chinese elsewhere in the West, or predicting racial violence in Los Angeles. Thank you, Michael. And we, I mentioned uh, Kelly Lytle Hernandez's really important book, City of Inmates, earlier. I would add to that in terms of recent scholarship of violence and lawlessness and a kind of vigilante spirit in early Los Angeles, um, John Mac Farragher's uh, great book, Eternity Street, um, subtitle Violence and Justice in Frontier Los Angeles, which covers a lot of this same historical, um, this, this same historical territory. Um, and, and I think the, um, the points that you make, Michael, um, about, uh, uh, about how that was on our minds is, is very important. Um, another question, this is from D Dylan Williams in the chat. Did the committee take into account the presentations of monuments like the Fort Moore Pioneer Memorial, which has glorified American Manifest Destiny since it was built in the 1950s when issuing their recommendations. Very much so, and I'll say a few words and then I'll see if the panelists have thoughts on this question. Um, we really did spend a lot of time discussing what to do with problematic memorials, um, statues, monuments that exist in the city. And where we came down is that there are, there are uh, um, monuments, memorials, and episodes where removal really is uh, the best course of action. Um, and so you have seen activists take down uh, statues of Junipero Serra. You have seen Confederate monuments um, that I think there was a, a consensus in our group, monuments like that, um, that deserve to be not a, it's important to make a distinction, not a race. These are not figures that need to deserve to be erased from the historical record, quite the contrary. It's more a question of the role that the city has in choosing which historical figures to honor and venerate and which ones we want to remove from that kind of veneration. Um, so that we were very clear in saying there are moments where removal is the most appropriate option, but there will be many more uh, moments where some kind of added contextualization or attempt to really put a memorial into a broader context uh, will be the course of action that makes the most sense. Um, and I think that that um, is, connected to an idea that we spent a lot of time talking about, which is that we think of memorials and monuments as fixing a certain historical uh, period or episode um, in history. But often what they do much more directly than that is they reflect the contemporary values of the, of the culture at the moment that they're added in positive and negative ways. And I think we've all learned a lot in the last couple of years about the number of Confederate monuments, which were not put up immediately following the Civil War. In fact, they were put up in the 1920s um, and they accompanied the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the rise of other attempts 
um, uh, that were connected to racial violence. Um, and so that idea that monuments don't just reflect the, the, the historical episode that they're concerned with, but also the, the culture in which they were produced uh, and when they were added as part of this conversation. And so, yes, we talked a lot about, uh, about Fort Moore and we talked a lot about this larger and, and really tricky question, frankly, of how to recontextualize uh, monuments that perhaps don't rise to the level of, of, of necessitating removal. Uh, Christopher, can I jump in with a question Please. to you Please. and to Annie? Uh, Christopher, if, if I can ask you to put your architecture critic hat back on or ask Annie to put her architect critic back, uh, her architect hat back on, uh, I want to ask the uh, Triforium question. Why is it that so many efforts to create public art or memorials or public places in LA seem to go wrong. That is something misfires, uh, the designer doesn't quite get it right, uh, and, and the opportunity to use physical places to send a message, somehow, sometimes in LA, they don't turn out right. Why is that? Annie. I, I can attempt to do this, and I'm sure Christopher will have give you a much better answer. I think it ultimately comes to the depth of questions that were asked at the beginning of the creation of that memorial. And the more universal or enduring those values can be, uh, after, you know, those questions, um, I think the more likely those memorials will be relevant, you know, after a long period of time. I don't know the history of the Triforium. I was excited when they got it working again for a brief period of time. Um, and I, you know, I thought at least there's something going on on that plaza, but uh, I don't know why it was there to begin with, you know. And so for me in the modern time, reading that uh, as, a, as a public space in the city, it didn't connect to me. So I care less about it. Right. Whereas if you say, you know, let's say take Grand Park or something like that, where uh, certainly it's a kind of generous display of um, sort of civic uh, gathering space, right? Um, then I think everyone can be behind things such as that. Um, we think about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, why it has such a universal appeal. Uh, the fact that you have space, right, that, that is not so specific that you cannot associate with it, although even though I don't know any of the names of those veterans, right, I see the effect of people putting in artifacts in the cracks of the granite, you know, my body is brought underground to kind of feel the, the kind of weight of that period of history, and then I see the names, and even though I don't know who Steve Miller is, I know a Steve, I know a Miller, I know somewhere in my extended family, someone who has some relationship to that period, right? So there's a kind of uh, humanization or a universalization of experience that those successful memorials, the enduring ones tend to have, and I think ultimately is have the creators of that memorial uh, ask enough questions, the deeper questions um, to affect, you know, what is, what are they designing for, right? So if you hit only a couple layers and it's only about an in incident in time, that's never going to endure. I think I think Annie really summed it up well, and I and I think um, I'll just say quickly in closing before we hand it back to Michael um, to to help thank all of you for being here. That there, you know, one of the critiques on the report of the way that things have op the way that um, the city has operated when it comes to civic memory and monuments and memorials is there has been a kind of patronage element. It has been a way in which individual elected officials are. Um, delivering a little slice of public space in terms of a monument to um, one particular group or another without the kind of broad-based community discussion, Annie, that you mentioned. Um, so it's a very trenchant question, Michael. And the second thing I'll say on a more optimistic front is that we're really 
lucky to be doing this work at a moment where there is really uh, an, a new uh, and very rich and vital national conversation about how to redefine these questions. Um, we were lucky on the very first meeting of the Mayor's Office Civic Memory Group to uh, have a presentation from Mabel Wilson, who's a professor at Columbia and was on the design team uh, for the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers on the campus of the University of Virginia. And you can imagine how fraught uh, an effort that was to put a memorial to um, enslaved laborers around the corner from Jefferson's lawn. Um, and we were very, very moved and impressed by the community process that was followed in that case and the, the extensive broad-based community conversations on campus and in in the, in the city of Charlottesville that really um, laid the foundation for that project. Um, and so ever since hearing that presentation, we have been looking at additional models. I would, again, um, suggest uh, looking at the work that Monument Lab is doing. They're really leading on a national basis to reconsider these, um, these questions. So we're at a moment where we're, we have lots of access to, to very smart thinking and, and new approaches to these, um, to these questions. So with that, um, as we get very close to 6.30, let me thank our panelists, first of all, uh, for joining us and for their comments and for their commitment to this work. Let me thank all of you in the audience for being with us and spending time on a Friday afternoon into a Friday evening. Um, and let me thank the Chinese American Museum, Dr. Gay Yuen in particular for her leadership in putting these events together and Michael Trong, who I will turn it back to now, as well as the staff at CAM, who have been really fantastic collaborators in all of this. Thanks, everyone. And say hello to Michael's cat, who just made a cameo appearance. Thank you. Yes, my cat likes to jump in right when I go on camera and whatnot. But, uh, you know, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you for the panelists for such a deep and thoughtful discussion about what memorials are. You know, memorials for us at CAM is not just a place to remember but you know the building itself, the Chinese American Museum, is located in the Garnier Building, one of the last buildings of historic Chinatown. So it's also a place that reclaims history. So thank you for so much for really thinking about ways to bring back our history in Los Angeles and whatnot to the audience. No closing remarks. Just want to say happy weekend to everyone, and thanks again for uh, for your participation, and again to the panelists for a terrific conversation. Good night. Thanks everybody. for everyone's leadership. Thank you, Christopher, Michael, and Jessica for you guys' leadership. Thank you so much.